Welcome to Codex, a history of video games. My name is Tyler Osby. And I'm Mike Coletta. And this week we're going to talk about a game series that I have very little experience with um, that's very spooky, very scary for, you know, just in time for spooky season. Uh, we're going to be talking about some Resident Evil. Mike is the Resident Evil, the resident Resident Evil specialist on the podcast. Ooh, Resident Evil. That's the whole Ooh. game is, is me talking in that voice. No, so actually uh, <laughs> we covered Resident Evil in very briefly, I mentioned it in our early horror games podcast we did on episode 81. And I oh, yeah. said... I would give it and some other stuff the justice it deserves in its own episode. And now we're here, essentially. Um, if you're a big Resident Evil fan, full disclosure, I have never beaten Resident Evil. I have played it uh, as a child. It was very scary. I didn't understand it. Um, but I will talk a little bit more about that later on in the podcast. So uh, if we want, though, to actually talk about Resident Evil, or as it's called in Japan, Biohazard. It is a different Ooh. name in Japan. Um, we have to start with the facts. And this is a new thing. This is a new thing. Remember Brett? Brett Grimes emailed us saying like about mm -hmm. a template for like all the things we could say of like for uniformity, essentially. Yeah, yeah, in yeah. In the podcast. Yeah. We're using Brett's template. I'm calling Thanks, it. Brett. We're doing it. I'm calling the segment Grime Facts or, or Grime Deets. I haven't decided yet. We're, we're working on it. If you have any yeah. ideas. Here comes I like the, both of those. Both of those are so good, I don't know which one to pick. Here comes the Daily Grime. Is that good? That's oh, good, yeah. Oh, weekly man, Grime. We're so good. The Weekly Grime. That's, it is weekly. <laughs> we do not do this daily. Well, actually, Tyler and I just do Daily Grimes to each other with other people knowing. Yeah, yeah. No. <laughs> but Okay, so, Grime Facts. Here we go. Developer, Capcom. The game was originally released on PlayStation in Japan. This is the first release to date on March 22nd, 1996. They are, here are all the systems... The game was on PlayStation. Uh, there was also a Resident Evil Director's Cut also released on PlayStation in September 1997. There is a DualShock version of the game also released on PlayStation. Extra spooky because of Rumble? Because of Rumble. Yeah, very Rumble spooky. On uh, August 1998, the Sega Saturn version was released on July 25th, 1997. The Windows version in Japan also was released on December 6th, 1996. It later came in September 17th, 1997 for other places in the world. There was a canceled Game Boy Color port that I straight up Ooh. think was canceled because from what I understand, it was bad. Um, there it was is too a, spooky. Yep, too spooky. You can't, you can't take spooky portable. You can't do that. It's too scary. Uh, GameCube, there was a GameCube remake on March 22nd, 2002. And then there was the way I played this game, a Nintendo DS port called Resident Evil Deadly Silence that was released on January 19th, 2006. Personally, I think if you were going to play this game now, you should just get it on Steam. That's probably the oh, easiest way. It is on Steam. There's a collection oh, on Steam. Yeah, a Resident Evil collection. So that's what I would go with. My personal experience playing the game, I played the Deadly Silence version. I played it for like five hours probably total um and then i kind of stopped playing my ds in general and i sold all that stuff which is really regretful because resident evil deadly silence goes online right now for 120 dollars it is a considered rare game it is not a lot of copies made of that game and it's like a ds game that's actually worth money so could have made some cash money off of that I mean, I never would have sold it, though. I would have just been like, that's worth $120. And then I would have just kept it on a shelf the rest of my life. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, the number of copies sold, uh, it's hard to tell with all these different releases, obviously. But uh, Capcom's investor relations website said that the original Resident Evil, this is the original PlayStation version, sold 2.75 million units, which is a wow, lot. Wow, wow. The Director's Cut version, including the DualShock Edition, that is also Director's Cut, but with the DualShock controller, is 2.33 million copies. And then it's pretty much like the best-selling PlayStation game of all time. At wow, the time. I did not know that. No, I, I'm sorry. Best-selling PlayStation game at the time. Oh, because at the time, okay. Resident Evil 2 is the best-selling PlayStation game of all time. <laughs> okay, <laughs> only to be outdone by its sequel. Yeah, just I think, I'm, I'm pretty sure that's what I say later on down the road. Maybe I'm completely just, you know, wrong. So uh, the genre of the game is survival horror. In fact, this pretty much puts survival horror on the map. Um, not the first survival horror game, which we're going to get to in a second, but it was still pretty much, this is pretty much where the genre came from was Resident Evil. Um, that's also its accolade, uh, average time to complete. So this is a new thing that's on the grime facts that I enjoy 6.5 hours. If you want to play the main story or eight, if you're trying to do the side quests that is not completionist though, completionist is 
a lot more hours. And the game, the PlayStation version, holds a 91 out of 100 on Metacritic, which is very good. Hmm. Right? That's pretty good. Yeah, that's very good. Yeah. So let's talk about development of Resident Evil. And fun fact, this was actually influenced by a game that I mentioned on our early horror games episode, Sweet Home. Sweet Home is a 1989 NES game where you played as a documentary film crew that enters an artist's mansion to recover five precious, priceless frescoes. And it turns out, whoops, the mansion's haunted. Scary. So that's the story. Classic survival horror. Classic. So actually, what's funny about Sweet Home is it was based on a movie, and this is the rare, I will say extremely rare, occurrence where the game is better than the movie. So this is actually the first, I would say, survival horror game before Resident Evil that put it on the map, you know? Wow. Um, and you know that because Resident Evil was originally supposed to be a remake of Sweet Home. In fact, there are things that Resident Evil is famous for, like the limited item inventory, uh, the maze-like mansion that has all these puzzles in it, uh, the puzzles specifically that you have to backtrack to solve, um, focusing on surviving and not winning the fight, uh, the door loading screen, the use of scattered notes and diaries to actually tell you the story, how many different endings there are based on what characters survive or how many characters survive, um, the use of death animations, uh, in also having individual like character exclusive items, like some characters can only carry a lockpick and some can only carry a lighter. Um, pretty much all of that is taken directly from Sweet Home. Hmm. So I've never heard of Sweet Home. Yeah, if you like Resident Evil, surprise. You also like Sweet Home. You just didn't know it yet. We must have uh, talked about that during our horror movie episode. Yeah, we did. We did. Horror we talked about it. It's yeah. funny because I looked back at those notes and I was like, wow, I didn't really give this game the justice it deserves, but it really does. It's it's pretty big. Um, the actual Sweet Home creator, uh, Tokuro Fujiwara, actually said, quote, basic premise was that I'd be able to do things that I wasn't able to include in Sweet Home, mainly on the graphics front. So really, this was straight up like the plan was Resident Evil was going to be like Sweet Home Remake. Um, nice. Yeah. So, um, and actually the whole team actually hopes that like the horror genre would become a part of like mainstream media and spoilers, it did. So good job, Resident Evil. Uh, Resident Evil's development actually took three years to complete. Uh, Shinji Mikami was originally uh, commissioned to make the game set in a haunted mansion like Sweet Home. And for the first six months, he worked alone. He only did script stuff, character stuff, and the setting. That's all he worked on by himself. He was the only person working on uh, the then unsaid, uh, untitled Sweet Home remake. And uh, much of the setting that we now know and love were directly influenced by, for example, the Overlook Hotel in the Stephen King movie The Shining. Mm -hmm. um, and then Mikami also cited the 1979 film Zombie as uh, an inspiration for the game. Uh, over time, though, like the psychological horror was replaced in Resident Evil which was, I guess I should tell you, still titled, untitled Sweet Home Remake. Um, because, and that's what kind of turned it into Resident Evil. Like, it was less about spooky ghosts and more about George Romero, hey, let's fight zombies, American style of game. That's what it became. Uh, so they moved away from ghosts, went all in on zombies. And if it weren't for the 1992 game, Alone in the Dark, which is very cool, and I highly recommend you go do some YouTube stuff of that, uh, Resident Evil would have been a first-person shooter. Which is kind of bananas wow. to think about. Okay, yeah. that would make sense. I mean, it's kind of a third-person shooter with a fixed camera angle. At least the first game is, right? And yeah. later, later on ones are like straight-up third-person shooters. Yeah, so like actually Alone in the Dark did the fixed camera angle so well that Mikami just switched the whole game over from first person into that. Um, and I think that really makes it extra spooky because it's just like you can't really you can't really see everything, you know, and that makes it so those mm -hmm. zombies can hide behind cabinets and scary stuff. So um, only there's only one concept art of the original single person prototype uh left and it's been available since the 1990s if you want to go take a look at it and i'll just say it looks a lot like doom because everything in the 1990s looks like doom so especially if it was a first person shooter yeah and especially if it was about zombies so yep. <laughs> uh during the development they also played with co-op mechanics so they thought Ooh. this would be a co-op game but they ended up like taking those out of the game and pretty much their whole reasoning was like technologically it just didn't work very well and it just kind of pulled away from the gameplay experience other things along with co-op that they removed from the game but they uh, previewed at some points they uh, previewed a cemetery level that didn't actually show up until the gamecube remake of resident evil in 2002 they put it back in there then but it was not in the original they had real-time weapon changes in the in the preview versions of the game um, they also had 
an area that was like guest houses and a tower, and those were later replaced with a guard house and a laboratory. So a lot of changes. And this is, keep in mind, like they're showing this stuff in previews, and then they don't make it to the final game. So someone could be reading a magazine in like 1995 and getting super stoked about, oh, we'll play through this cool cemetery, and then they'll load up the game in 96, and it's just not there. Um, Bummer. Yeah, but then in 2002... They'll buy the GameCube remake, and it'll be there, and they'll be like, I have waited my whole life for this moment. (laughs) So even though Capcom actually had a motion capture studio at this time, they did not use motion capture for the development of Resident Evil, which I thought was interesting. Uh, Instead, the team just straight up kicked it old school. They read books and did research to see how like certain enemies would move and behave uh, it's just kind of bizarre that they did that instead of using this mocap studio they had. But hey, you know, it was the 90s. So sometimes you got to kick it old school. Also, mm-hmm. I'll say this later on too. Capcom did not think this game would do very well. That's an interesting part about this whole process is like the 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 suits upstairs, you know, if you could say that, mm-hmm. didn't think this would be a very good game. Yeah, well, what do the they... suits know? Yeah, what do they know? They were proved so wrong. Uh, they so wear anyway. suits. That's right. What are, these people wear suits. They don't even know what's going on. You know, they have no idea. They're just sitting out there suiting it up in their suits all day. Mm-hmm. As a suit people. Tyler and I never wear suits. If you guys know. <laughs> <or not. laughs> okay. So <laughs> uh, there were two characters that were actually replaced in the original Resident Evil. Uh, before Rebecca, you had Dewey, who was kind of the comic relief of the group, and he was replaced with Rebecca. And then instead of the character Barry, there was actually a cyborg named, It's I think it's Geezer, G E I Z E R. It's Geezer or Geyser. I'm not entirely I'd probably sure. say Geyser if it, Geyser, it were me, but I don't know. I was reading it like old Geezer, you know, like an insult yeah, for an old person. It seems like the wrong, the wrong it's uh, G- name you would want to give someone. Yeah, that would just yeah. be two, e, two E's. Yeah. I'd so say it's gotta be It's got to be Geyser. Okay. I can't read and it's Geyser. Uh, and they were, uh, Geyser, by the way, was like a strong man, like muscle type character. And they were both replaced by Rebecca and Barry. So if you like oh. Rebecca and Barry, hey, good for you. Now, if you're like, I, I wonder what Dewey. Dewey and Geyser would have been like, I'm so sorry. So <laughs> uh, almost all of development was done on silicone graphics hardware. Um, they used Soft Image. It's a computer program for all you, you tech nerds out there. There you go. That's what you got. Uh, the PlayStation was also actually chosen as the platform they were developing on because like, remember when we were like talking about this when the video game history, everyone's like, well, the PlayStation, it does so many polygons. Like everyone so loves many polygons. polygons. Yeah, so it's, it's this is the, this is the time we went from bits, and now we're in the time of polygons. Yeah, and PlayStation could do the most polygons because so many polygons. They were using a CD drive, you know, sixty four. They're still cartridging it up. We'll talk about that later too. No okay. polygons. Hey, hey, N sixty four has got no polygons. You know, that's what they said. <laughs> that's um, what they said. Capcom actually very very hesitantly ported Resident Evil to the Sega Saturn, as I mentioned above earlier, um, because at first they weren't entirely sure the hardware could handle it. And in fact, they straight up told people like Capcom was telling the press like this port may take a while, (laughs) (laughs) which I thought was really funny. They're like, total honesty, this port may take a long time to do. Look, the Saturn kind of sucks. So this is going to take a little while. The Saturn version was actually unveiled at the April 1997 Tokyo Game Show. And at the same time that was being shown, Capcom was showing the demo of the sequel for the PlayStation to kind of give you an idea of how long it took them to get the Saturn port out there. Poor Um, Sega. They were really floundering at this point in time. It's just sad. Yeah, the Saturn. Because, you know, people I feel like are nostalgic about the Dreamcast. I don't really know people. Have we gotten emails about people that are nostalgic for the Saturn? I don't know. I'm certainly not. I know. Is anyone out there nostalgic for a Saturn? I don't think I even laid hands upon a Sega Saturn as a child. I don't know if I knew anyone that had one. Now I think about it. I had one neighbor with a Saturn, but I don't think we ever played it. I think we played Super Nintendo way more. And because the Saturn didn't work because that guy cried into it the whole time because he had a Sega (laughs) Saturn. It was just full of tears. Full of tears. All right. So the the one thing that Resident Evil is also known for is these full live action motion video sequences. Okay. Like telling a story, very B movie style, and those sequences were actually filled in Japan, fil- filled, filmed in Japan with a cast of American actors. Um, all of the Japanese releases, by the way, of this game were released with English voice acting and Japanese captions. As Interesting, text, which seems odd to me, you know. Um, but they eventually actually 
they actually did do Japanese voice performances that were recorded for the initial release of the game, and they just never used them because Mikami <laughs> didn't think the performances were very good. So it's like the opposite of anime where people will watch in Japanese with uh, English subtitles. They In Japan, they'll take these like English or American style games and and watch and play them in English with Japanese subtitles. Yeah, apparently. But oh. I, I, don't, I yeah. mean, they were kind of forced to do that. But hey, the game was still a hit in Japan. So I guess that's great. And I mean, that takes a lot from Mikami to be like, I don't think the performances were very good. So we're not going to use them. Because if I mean, I was in those shoes, I'd be like, yeah, you, why wouldn't you put the localized versions in the game? You know? Yeah, apparently they were bad. Apparently. Hey, you know, uh, however, the lead programmer on the game um, said that like they weren't actually aware that the localization was bad mm. in the game um as far as like the international releases go and that is one of the reasons that they redubbed the 2002 remake on oh, they redid all the voices in that they remake they redid all the voices in that remake because the localization was very poor in from what I from like and I when I say localization I mean how it was translated over to English or other languages from Japanese because the team entirely spoke Japanese they didn't know the localization was bad and so that's it was redubbed for the 2002 remake that's an important thing to know if you if you're playing the GameCube version you know which is I guess a cool way to play the game if you were going to play and if you have a yeah. GameCube the GameCube version is a very good version of the game it has the same metacritic score as the uh, PlayStation version. I think that's the version that's on Steam too. Is like the the HD remake of Game. Yeah, the that GameCube would make version. sense. I think because it's a part of that that collection too. So yeah, play it on Steam. You got it on GameCube. Play it on GameCube. That's always fun to go back to those old consoles anyway. Mm-hmm. So, um, oh, here's an important fact. So you're probably wondering this whole time. Hey, Mike, you mentioned that the game is called Biohazard in Japan. Why did they change the name? Well, Chris Kramer was the director of communications at Capcom, and he made a very good point, and that would be you cannot trademark Biohazard in the United States for two reasons. Uh, There was already a video game called Biohazard Battle, and there was an alternative metal band called Biohazard in New York, so you could not (laughs) do the game. And so what they did, they couldn't call it Biohazard, so what they had to do was they had to take and do a contest. There was an internal company contest to name the game and because the game took place in a mansion that's why it's resident evil it's like kind of like a pun and what's funny is kramer like chris kramer the director of communications thought this was a terrible name he called it super cheesy but they didn't have any other alternative and the marketing team actually really liked the names and they couldn't convince like so they just convinced capcom japan and uh mikami that the name fit and he's like well all right i mean if american audiences like it you're american you'll know and so they just made it resident evil <laughs> like that's how well, the name was changed it's as good a name as any i suppose i don't mind it i think it's okay i actually like it too yeah i want to know who won that contest yeah what did Who's they win? responsible yeah, beyond they win? getting to name the game they won maybe that's it a, yeah, they just want a copy of the game that every single person in the also in the office got <laughs> for free. <laughs> uh, okay, there's also another difference between the Japanese and U.S. version of the game, and that is the Japanese version actually has a vocal ending theme. Ooh. Um, I will not butcher the Japanese name of the song, but it will translate to, in, a, in English, it translates to, I won't let this end as a dream. Hmm. It sounds very nice, right? And that was done by a J-pop band called Fumitaka Fuchigami. And that is not in any other versions of the game. It's only in the original Japanese version of the game. Is Were they like it. big and famous at the time? I'm guessing this is like so. like a big, a big get for Resident Evil? I'm going to look I, this band up. I hope so. Yeah, I hope so. Look it up. Let me know. Matt in Japan um, probably knows. Matt in Japan would know. He knows everything. Okay. So um, Fujiwara said that the game was originally actually targeted towards a core audience and he only expected to sell around 200,000 copies like what I said before like they didn't expect ca- the game to be very successful um, but uh, they actually Mikami himself was a little worried that because this was a horror game it wouldn't really sell and boy oh boy were they all completely wrong it sold like gangbusters hot cakes like I wow. said one of the best selling PlayStation games of all time. But this whole time I've been talking about development, I didn't even tell you what Resident Evil is. Okay? So, 
It is July 24th, 1998. There are a series of bizarre murders taking place on the outskirts of the fictional Midwestern town, Raccoon City. You scared, Tyler? Am I saying the mood right? I'm super scared. A place called Raccoon City sounds so scary. I don't like raccoons. They're scary. I know, right? The Raccoon City Police Department's STARS team is assigned to investigate. And STARS, I don't actually know what it, like the acronym stands for. Do you want to look that up too, Tyler? I should have looked that up. I just kind of, you know, took it as, well, I'll be like STARS team. That sounds cool. Um, Bravo team got lost. There's no contact. Um, Alpha team was sent to investigate their appearance. Kind of weird. They sent Bravo team before Alpha team, you know? I thought that's why you have letter designations. Alpha team? I don't but know. That's, but that's fine. Um, when Alpha Team gets there, they see that Bravo Team helicopter crashed. They get to the site, and then they are suddenly attacked by a pack of monstrous dogs, and Joseph Frost is killed. Oh, the STARS team member we never Stars met. STARS stands for Special Tactics and Rescue Service. <laughs> I love the service. <laughs> special tactics and rescue sounds awesome but they go service like we're, we're providing a service <laughs> that, they're, they're, when i when i worked at the shop co in pullman washington we there was a thing there called star service that we did and the star stood for something about helping customers or something but that's what i think of when was i it, hear of this was it special tactics team. and rescue special it, tactics and rescue yeah it was when the the registers got overwhelmed and they needed more people to open up registers Okay, we need we need to have a series. I didn't know you worked at the shop, Cohen Pullman, and this is just sidebar about our friendship. Not even as podcasting right now. I don't think you ever told me that, and I never knew that. And I have so oh. many questions for you. Okay, the minute we, we can talk the, about it afterwards. I love Shop Co. Okay, back to the podcast. <laughs> um, so after uh, what happens is Joseph Frost, uh, the member of Special Tactics and Recon Service, a rescue service, uh, he gets murdered by dogs, and their pilot Brad. Vickers freaks out, panics, and just takes off. And he leaves all of the team members there. Chris Redfield, Jill Valentine, Albert Wesker, and Barry Burton. And now those four have to go investigate the nearby mansion that they're like kind of also, you know, hot holing up in overnight to hide from the dogs. Mm -hmm. And you know what? There's evil plots. There's double agents and a whole lot of scary situations. So scary. And so you hit one of the game's four possible endings which i will not talk about because this is a game from 1998 but it's still a hit maybe some people haven't played it feel like they should so the game is pretty much you have like very limited inventory you have to solve these puzzles around the mansion the fixed camera angles makes it so things can really jump out at you the game is actually pretty scary like it's it's, i think this game i mean i'm I'm a scaredy cat but this game is scary if you ask me yeah um so um, I actually played the DS version in the mid 2000s and I f- was freaked out even on like a little portable console. You know, it was, it was, it was super scary. Um, and the only thing that I remember being is I, I did I did at one point get pretty stuck, which kind of goes back to that old video game adage of like, for me personally, like how do people beat video games before the Internet? You know, like how Just did you know where to go? Magazines and strategy guides or calling the Nintendo hotline where they would charge you like two bucks a minute to tell you how to find the last thing in Zelda. Oh, yeah, that's that true. Existed. I do love that. Game counselors. Game counselors. That is such a cool... They, they go into that in that um, high score documentary on Netflix. Yeah. It's really good. Um, so the the big overarching question about why we're doing this is why is this game so important? Well, um, there's three things in my mind that make this game super big and notable and also like a trendsetter. And that is it is the first successful survival horror video game. And I say that financially and culturally because while Sweet Home was like had a cult following and was really fun and actually a very good game. I think Resident Evil really perfected it and brought it to the masses. Um, the second reason I will say is that this kind of brought forth the cinematic nature of video games. Like, and keep in mind, these like cutscenes that are live action are by no means like Oscar worthy, but the B movie cutscenes really fit with like the scary situations in the game. And so I think it kind of showed that video games could be cinematic because we had like Final Fantasy cinematics. But I Mm -hmm. feel like in that you look at a Final Fantasy cinematic, like, oh, this is a video game, you know, but this was kind of trying to take you down this like horror movie route, you know, that was super scary. So, yeah, uh, cinematic cinematography. And then the other thing is, hey, are you an American living in 2020? Are you really tired of zombies? Well, you can thank Resident Evil for that because they were the ones that brought zombies back, essentially, like zombie movies. 
It's from George Romero. We're in like the 70s and the 80s, and they kind of fell away in the 90s. And then the zombie genre was kicked right back into mainstream culture, starting with Resident Evil. You know, if you're like, oh, what about Walking Dead? Nope. Resident Evil is the first one. You know what I mean? So that's why. So you know what? Thank Resident Evil. Go up to your Resident Evil copy at your house right now and pick it up and say thank you, Resident Evil, for bringing zombies back into mainstream culture. If you're a zombie fan. Thank are, you, are, Resident are, Evil. I'm not are you a sick, Are fan. you sick of it? I'm kind of sick of it. Personally. I am kind of sick of it, yeah. I think it was good, and then it just got uh, bananas. I think I was talking on Discord to one of our... Uh, one of our it was awesome guy. I don't want to say his real name. He doesn't want me to say his real name. But I we were talking about how the zombie thing. Like I watched Walking Dead when it came out, you know, in college, mm-hmm. and then I didn't watch it for a really long time. I tuned right back in again, and I was like, oh, this is the exact same TV show. Like seven years later, like the format's the same. They're just doing the same stuff. <laughs> yeah, it's, <laughs> like, it's, it, it's run from zombies, get to a new place, build a civilization. Some backstabbing happens. And suddenly we need to run from zombies again and find a new place to set up a civilization. Yeah, exactly. I was, I was blown away. But it's I was over like, and you over know and what? Over. Thank you, Resident Evil, for putting that in our hearts and our minds. Oh, they also, um, George Romero actually himself said that Resident Evil and then the arcade game House of the Dead. Remember House of the Dead? It's still oh, around. Yeah. Um, mm-hmm. That were, those two things were at the forefront of bringing zombies back into pop culture. So that's pretty cool, if you ask me, that George Romero, Mr. Zombie himself, brought mm-hmm. that up about the video game so yeah take it out walking dead okay now we're on to resident evil 2 electric boogaloo all right yeah the greatest that, subtitle it's not the name but i think it would be a lot better game if they embrace the electric boogaloo part of it okay so developed by once again capcom now the release date in systems on this one are a little bit interesting to me because it's still like playstation's first january 21st 1998 Windows in February 1999 on all regions. Nintendo 64, October 31st, 1999. I did not even Whoa. know there was a Resident Evil for Nintendo 64. We're going to get to it later. Yeah, it's one of the most technically impressive N64 games, too. I think it's the largest cartridge oh, ever yeah. for, for oh, a yeah. N64 game. Tech nerds rejoice when we talk about this in a second. Yeah. It's pretty it's a, cool. It's a in, very impressive port considering the game's like two or three CDs itself, right? Yeah, it's it, they did some pretty crazy stuff. Uh, Sega Dreamcast, um, that version of the game came out in Japan on December 22nd, 1999. And then there was a GameCube version of this also in North America on January 14th, 2003. It came out in other places too, but the GameCube dates in North America is what I wrote down. So, number of copies sold. With 4.96 million copies sold, the PlayStation version of Resident Evil 2 was a commercial success. And it's the franchise's best-selling game on a single platform. So remember earlier when I said that this game was the best-selling game on PlayStation? I was mm-hmm. wrong. It's entirely based on the version of the franchise. <laughs> thing. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Sales statistics, by the way. Okay. Side tangent. Finding sales statistics that are accurate for video games, especially ones that came out in the 90s, it's so hard to do. There's some weird websites, but I go on them and I'm like, I don't know if these numbers are reliable, you know? So... Sorry, mm-hmm. everybody. Just Resident Evil 2, the franchise's best-selling game on a single platform, that being the PlayStation platform, with it's 4.96 million copies. Pretty much 5 million copies sold. It's pretty high on the list of uh, of highest-selling games for, for the PlayStation, though, according oh, to Wikipedia. Yeah, it's Good. number 17. Gran Turismo is the number one with... See, nearly yeah, 11 and million I, copies. And I, when I even said when I even said this was the best one on PlayStation, I was doubting myself because you have some really big like PlayStation bangers in there. I'm sure mm-hmm. you know your Crash Bandicoots, you know, yeah. like that kind of stuff. So okay, uh, there were 810,000 copies of the DualShock version shipped in March 1999, and that's just like a remake that came out later. So you know this game's it's popping. Yeah, it's popping off. Mm -hmm. Uh, genre or gameplay style once again we got survivor horror they didn't really change much with this version from the old game and i think this made it so successful it is a little bit longer than the original resident evil it takes about 8.5 hours if you're just playing the main story and it has an 89 out of 100 for both the playstation and the nintendo 64 version which i think is pretty neat Uh, the funny part about development for this game though is how much fans complained that this game took so long to complete when it was only two years between Resident oh, Evil 1. Oh, that's like nothing. I know. I know. This is, it just kind of like goes back to like video games before 
where like it took a long time. I'm using this in quotes, you know, but now it's like games are developed. It takes five to six years to develop a big game. Like think about Elder Scrolls or Grand Theft Auto and how much time they take to develop those games. Oh, and man. the reason that the development time took long again in quotes, because it wasn't that long is because they essentially made two games. So the first is now dubbed Resident Evil 1.5. And this was the direction that the director, Shinji Mikami, wanted the game to go. He was the original director, by the way, because he was now a producer on the second iteration. And this game took place two months after the events of the first game. Raccoon City was taken over. And the plot of this game would essentially end Resident Evil and this series would be done. This was Mikami's vision, was that Resident Evil would be two games and the series is over. Mm, they have too much new- money to be made. Right. So they have a new director, though, Hideki Kamiya, and he is working along with Mikami to, like, create the game. But he didn't really see Mikami's vision, and they had some creative differences on how the game would go. It got to a point where Mikami actually had to say, "Okay, I'll sit back. You guys just send me a build once a month and I'll look it over and give you my notes. Because he was I mean, I think it's kind of one of those things where the game is like your baby, you know, Mm -hmm. and like. Now you're like not directing it anymore and you're in more of a producer role. And so it's kind of hard. I'm guessing yeah, that was what's going on. So uh, Mikami was also arguing with the supervisor at the time at Capcom, Yoshiki Akamoto, and he wanted Resident Evil to become a multi game meta series. Uh, like, think about a game that would take the place in the same world, but with different characters and different stories to tell. Okay. So, kind of, they're going to build a world instead Mm -hmm. and they're just going to put people in it and they're not all related and it's going to be a big old franchise which i think is what it became so spoilers everybody but um eventually mikami backed off and he let mikama uh sorry uh kamiya make resident evil the way he wanted to make it and the result uh was not good and i should mention i say it that way but it is not anyone's fault i think they don't really blame anyone for the 1.5 version of the game being good um the game just didn't reach the quality they wanted it to be. And one of the, a couple of the big things they made and the reason they scrapped resident evil 1.5 was some gameplay stuff just didn't work. And the locations were really dull and boring was the quote they used. So Aww. like this, the city didn't look the way they wanted it to. The game didn't play the way they wanted it to. Instead of forcing it out and being like, this is resident evil two, They just scrapped the whole thing and started new. So uh, the first thing they did is they brought in a professional screenwriter named Noboru Sujimura, and he uh, was hired on a trial basis. And but then they he was so impressive, like he fixed all these problems with their initial script that Okam- uh, uh, Akamoto was like, you know what, just uh, you just take over, just write the entire scenario for Resident Evil Two, and that's the Resident Evil Two we know and love today. Um, the only thing they could save from the 1.5 version was a few assets, but they really wanted to redo like the entire look of the game. So they rendered like the giant skyscrapers that you see of Raccoon City using a software program called O2. And each background took two to three weeks to render. Wow, that is incredible. It was an incredible amount of time considering computers of today will render hundreds of those per second. Probably. Yeah, it's just it's wow. just crazy to think about that. So uh, due to the detail of the main protagonists, Leon and Claire, only seven zombies could be on the screen at one time in Resident Evil 2. So they needed to make because uh, what they needed is the reason that the oh gosh, I'm having trouble explaining. So uh, the reason they did this was because they needed so many polygons for Leon and Claire to make them look like appealing and like people. Uh, that number <laughs> of polygons, by the way, 450. That's the magic number. To make a red. person look like a people? Yep. If I was going to make you out of polygons, Tyler, I'd start with 450. But I'd probably okay. add in like another 450 because I want people to really Aww. get your essence. Yeah. Thanks. You got it. So the voiceovers uh, were all done by uh, an all Canadian cast and they were recorded before the cutscenes were completed. So with each of the actors selected from a roster of 10 people per role. So um, they then took full motion videos using stop motion animations of action figures, which were then rendered to completed pictures with computer graphics. Why they did it this way, I have no idea. Hmm. They never explain that. 
but Ada's movie model uh, wasn't finished. So the only main character to not appear in a pre-rendered cutscene is Ada because just develop in development. She never got a like action figure model <laughs> made. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Rough go for Ada. Uh, the music for Resident Evil 2 was composed by Masami Yuda, uh, Shusaku Uchiyama and Sayun Nishigaki. Uh, and there was one track that was composed by Nosha Mizuta. Um, and what's funny is when they were like starting to compose the music for Resident Evil, they were told to convey desperation as the theme, which <laughs> I thought was just an interesting fact. Like, hey, for your music, just just make de- some sound desperate, you know, just real desperation in the music. <laughs> 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 So plot wise, what are we looking at? Well, I kind of mentioned it before. Um, it's they, it remains most of the same base plot from Resident Evil 1.5. Two months after the events of Resident Evil, um, the 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 community of Raccoon City transformed into zombies because of the T virus that was made by the Umbrella Corporation. Uh, Leon Kennedy is a police officer, and it's your first day of duty. Wow, what a <laughs> Cla- terrible first day! Right, Claire Redfield is a college student who's looking for her brother Chris. And she makes her way to the Raccoon City Police Department. Um, and then uh, you discover, of course, all the police are dead. Um, and that Chris left to investigate the Umbrella headquarters in Europe. And so then they split up and they look for survivors and find Never a way out of the city. Up. Yeah, they scooby doo this one. Totally. So um, Claire ends up meeting Sherry Birkin, who's like her character, you know, like her fr- her her. AI partner, and then uh, Leon it, it meets uh, Ada Wong, who is his partner, and they, uh, you know, they go around and uh, shenanigans ensue. Once again, I will not spoil the entire thing because you know I feel like with Halloween coming up, these are some spooky games you might want to play. You know, so yeah, I don't want to say think that's good the story. So uh, I do want to talk about the different versions of Resident Evil Two because I did mention there were versions that came out on other consoles. Um, the DualShock version of the game was once again created so you can get that sweet, sweet rumble functionality and so that you can get the analog control functions in the DualShock controller. Um, they also have a mini game called Extreme Battle in that game, and they have a rookie mode in Resident Evil 2. And if you play in rookie mode on the DualShock version, you start the main story with a powerful weapon with infinite ammunition. So that's helpful. Ooh. Uh, Now, we're going to talk about the Nintendo 64 version because this, like you said, is really nuts. So the Nintendo 64 version of Resident Evil 2 is one of the few games released on the Nintendo 64 to have full motion video. Uh, It overcomes the limited storage capacity um, on the cartridge, which is bananas, because the PlayStation version of this had 700 megabyte discs and two of those, (laughs) and they had to compress it onto a 64 megabyte N64 game pack. Uh, this was all done by Angel Studios. They were the people hired to make a port. And they had 12 months and a budget of $1 million to do this. Wow. So what they did, the audio and video assets were aggressively compressed, but then they used novel techniques that shifted the burden more towards the processing power of the N64 versus the storage. And that's yeah. the basic way of how they did it. Um, there- go ahead. Oh, I'll say there is a very good video on YouTube by I think it's by Modern Vintage Gamer where he goes into a bit of a technical explanation of how they did all this and it's it's very interesting if you're into that kind of stuff. Oh yeah, good call. I should watch that after this. I did not watch that. So um the Nintendo 64 version also offers features that were not included on anything. So yeah, not only do they compress the PlayStation version, they also add more stuff to the game. So you have the ability, because it's a Nintendo game, to change the blood color, you know, if you want to do a little paintball mode. Um, you can randomize items during each playthrough. Oh, um, like a Zelda randomizer? Yeah. Cool. There's a first-person control, uh, control scheme that's more responsive that you can switch to. Um, also, the port has 16 new documents that are called the X-Files that are hidden throughout the four scenarios in the game. And they actually kind of tell you more about series lore. And the interesting part is is they connect the story of Resident Evil 2 to other Resident Evil games. Some of those games hadn't come out yet. So it was like teasing stuff in the 64 version for games that would come out way later, which is pretty cool. That's very cool. Yeah. uh, The Nintendo 64 version also adjusts its display resolution depending on the number of polygons currently on the screen. That's another way they helped with that compression. And it supported the controllers, uh, the controllers, the consoles expansion pack... Yeah, if you had that expansion pack in there, you can get 640 by 480. Wow. Yeah. 
technologically advanced, I would say. So uh, there were some way worse ports of Resident Evil. For example, uh, Tiger Electronics. You know them, Tyler, right? The old handheld people? Oh my gosh, yes. <laughs> they released a sprite-based 2.5D, that's always good when they throw a 0. 0.5 into a dimension, a version 5D. of their Game.com handheld in late 1998. Uh, the game only had Leon's story path, and they removed a ton of features in the game. Um, <laughs> In February 2013, an unfinished build of Resident Evil 1.5 was leaked on the internet. If you want to find out what that dull, quote, dull and boring game was like, you could, you know, if you have an afternoon. And there's also a port of Resident Evil 2 for the Sega Saturn that was developed internally at Capcom for a bit. But then technical difficulties led to its cancellation in October of 1998. And on that day, Tyler's friend who owned the Sega Saturn put more tears into his Sega Saturn. Oh, sad day. It was so sad. Legacy, though. Let's talk about the legacy of this game, because it's pretty cool. So, uh, Resident Evil 2, surprisingly, got more controversy stuff than Resident Evil 1 had. In Italy, it was banned temporarily in 1999, um, because the Movimento Diritti Civili, look at that, look at that Italian right there, the Civil Rights Movement. Um, is an organization it's a political like a political organization in italy they wanted it banned for a realistic depiction of violence and Mm -hmm. they actually seized over 5500 unsold copies of the game now this was later on reversed a few months later but for a time this version of the game was banned in italy which is kind of like you know you ban a game it just makes people want it more i think that's true resident evil 2 essentially was the beginning of the huge world we all now know in resident evil. So, I mean, it's really interesting to think about the fact that this could have just been a two game and done scenario, you know, like we could have, Mm -hmm. we could have resident evil one and two. We'd be sitting here right now being like these classics hold up to this day. How come there were never any sequels, but because this choice they made to redo 1.5 and make resident evil two more about the entire world of resident evil, we now have comic books, movies, novels, other spinoff games. I mean, this also further pushed zombies into pop culture. So thanks, Resident Evil 2, for doing that once more. Um, but I feel like this is a good place for us to stop talking about Resident Evil for now, because mm-hmm. this is kind of the start of something new as far as us seeing like, oh, the world of Resident Evil is about to open up. So um I have an idea for next week. I talked to Tyler about it. It's going to be very exciting. It's a game near and dear to our hearts. It's also Halloween-y themed, you know? Uh, Yeah, you can't can't say that. Uh, And so we'll talk about that one next week, though. We'll probably come back to Resident Evil at some point later on down the road, but certainly not a super high priority. We're kind of taking a little break from id. I feel like that's kind of good to do a little break Yeah, we still got a ways to go on that, so it's good to take some detours. Yeah, just take a little Halloween detour. Do some horror stuff for the next couple weeks, and then we'll get right back to it. Uh, But Tyler... What you been playing? This week, I've been playing uh, Halo 3 ODST with you. Yeah. Uh, You love that jazzy, those jazzy streets. It's so good. It's It's like such a good good noir. I keep bothering Mike with my like like noir uh, soliloquies as we play. Um, I think they're very funny. I think they're funny uh, too. I'm I'm having a great time with with that game, uh, and I'm glad you think that they're funny. Um, uh, I haven't really been playing... Much else. A little bit more Genshin Impact, not that much. Um, But uh, I've kind of been on a a little mini break from video games. I've been kind of watching some stuff and uh, catching up on other forms of media, watching some movies and things like that. So I haven't really spent a ton of time playing games this week. Um, But I would like to play some more ODST soon. Yeah. Um, Do you want to give us a little from the noir? Do you want to do that right now? Oh, I I can't remember any off the top of my head. I was sitting in my office one day when a covenant jackal walked in legs for days <laughs> <laughs> with a saxophone in the background <laughs> yeah <laughs> just master chief in a trench coat for no reason yeah it's, <laughs> even though it's he's raining not even in the game. <laughs> it's raining it's mo- the palette is mostly blue but or bright orange uh lighting um like not bright lighting but it's like sub- subdued like sort of oh, it's very good i really dig the aesthetic of odst and, and it's how I'm can master chief it. smoke a cigar through his visor so we all yeah, know. So strange. <laughs> pokes, pokes a hole in the visor. Yeah. Uh, he's just taking giant gulps of whiskey under his helmet. <laughs> just through the vent in his helmet. <laughs> yeah. 
Oh man, I, we should play that some more tonight. I love that game. That game yeah, it, was... it makes me so happy. It's it's very different. Like it's a, such a different Halo game. It's one of my favorites. Yeah, it it's I've never played it before, and it, it's really good. Um, we played some Among Us on Saturday night uh, with yeah. some friends from the Discord. So that that Codex was fun. Codex crew popped off. Yeah. Codex friends. Yeah, if you want to join our Discord, we play games. We do it. We've been. I I really want to play uh, that Phasmophobia one. I think it'll be fun for all of us yeah. to get scared together. It's not my kind of game usually, which is kind of why I want to try it because you need friends to play that game. I'm never gonna play it by myself, you know. So yeah, yeah. Uh, what have you been playing, Mike? Well, I uh, took it kind of slow on the Boulders Gate 3 this week because I don't want to burn myself out on it. And I also found out, like, for some reason I didn't know they were going to do this, even though it makes sense. They're definitely going to delete all of our saves, you know, when you're playing the game. And I didn't even realize that, but it's made it so I don't feel like I have to beat it. And in fact, it kind of makes me want to start a new character already and just like mess around, you know, with new character builds Mm -hmm. uh, if I know they're going to delete everything anyway. But I've been playing a lot of Mario 35. Like, I've been playing this game. Oh, I need to check that out still. I've been playing it too much. I've just been sitting, like, with TV on, ignoring the television, playing Mario 35. It's so fun. Um, I also played, actually, some Left 4 Dead with the Codex crew yesterday, which was super fun. Well, oh, how was that? So good. Gosh, I. it's amazing to me that they have a new update for that game in 2020. Yeah, it just came out like a couple of weeks ago. That's incredible. Yeah, it's a community update. They added a brand new campaign level, essentially, and they also added a ton of survival maps because there's like a survival mode in the game that I didn't even know was in in that at all. And uh, yeah, we played Left 4 Dead 2 because Left 4 Dead 2 is just, it has all of Left 4 Dead 1 in it. So why would you even go back to 1? But it was so fun. I've had such a good time. Um, I actually, uh, we got an email. Want Want me to read the email for us? Sure. Yeah, okay, so this first email, it's from Nick, and Nick says, this may be a long one. I haven't decided yet, so maybe buckle up. It's very entertaining. Uh, First, I want to thank you for putting together such a positive and heartwarming show. Every time I listen to the podcast, I leave happier than when I started. I listen to a lot of podcasts on the regular, and yours is one I look forward to the most. Oh, thank you. I actually save it until I have to do dishes, and now I suddenly look forward to doing dishes. Wow. All right. I I love a dishes podcast. That's something I do, too. Big fan of dishes podcast. Everyone get out there and you know what? Rate and, review and, rate and review us on Apple and say it's your favorite Dewey Dishes podcast. That would make me happy. Okay. So um, second, and this is where it gets personal. I wanted to thank you for keeping me afloat last year. The long story of it is that for a while there, I was unemployed and deeply depressed. My wife and I had to move back with my parents and the situation just kept snowballing. During that time, I started listening to Codex per the recommendation of a friend. The show helped remind me of simpler times. I had ambitions to be a game designer, and Codex reminded me of the optimism I had when I started playing games as a kid, yearning for some way to express myself in that crazy time. I started working on a project on the side, fueled partially by my hopeful vibes, by the hopeful vibes of your show. Um, A little over a year later, and I now have a job as a game designer at one of my favorite studios. What a dream. Very cool. I'm working on a project that millions of people play. And that side project I worked on, it's finally finished. It's called Nebula Within. And it's now on Steam, releasing October 20th. Can you believe it? So he actually sent us uh, some Steam keys and stuff here about his game Nebula Within. And we told him to post that in our Discord so we have, this is, by the way, this is not in the email. This is me talking. I don't know if I should ever say that, you know, professional podcasting. Here we go. <laughs> but uh, so what I had Nick do is it, there's a channel in Discord called uh, Plug Your Projects I made because we all want to know like what you guys are working on, you know, your own podcast, your own games, whatever. And uh, he put Nebula Within on there to check out. And I'm sure if you ask him, He'll 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 hook you up with a Steam key if you want to give it a try. I haven't tried it out yet, but he gave us Steam keys to Tyler, which is very nice to do. Ooh. So yeah, just check it out his game, play it play a game. It's really neat. And thank you so much for emailing. Um, uh, oh wait, uh, he has another. Uh, he has a PS actually. Um, uh, he said, uh, PS, please do an episode on pinball games like Sonic Pinball full tilt pinball that came with windows etc or an episode on shareware slash freeware i played so much shareware as a kid that's really good uh with all the love and jaybird blessings nick thank you nick uh yeah we that's a really good idea shareware and freeware and also space cadet pinball come on so good you played you played space cadet pinball right oh yeah 
everyone's played yeah. their fair share of Space Cadet Pinball. It was free with Windows XP, like the the demo version, uh, which not a lot of people know that was the demo version of it. And then I had the full version that had come with um, a Windows ME PC that my parents bought, and it had all three tables on it. It was very cool. Nice. Yeah, that's There are awesome. more than just Space Cadet. There are. You know, you can become a space captain if yep. you want to. But yeah, so yeah, uh, thank you for so much for the email, Nick. And if you're interested, the game is called Nebula Within, and it comes out on Steam on October 20th. And we'll be talking about it in the Discord if you guys want to ask questions or maybe he can give you a key. You can do some feedback or play a game just for fun. You know, we play the games for fun, right? I do. I like to play games for fun. Sure. That's right. So thank you so much for the email, Nick. We got another email, too. Do you want me to read this one or do you want to read it? Uh, go for it. I don't okay. have a up. That's all right. Uh, hi. I've been a long-time listener of the podcast. It's been a pleasure. This podcast isn't too serious and reliant on bias. It's free and open-minded. It's very you. You, too, should be proud of what you've done. Thank you. I had Thanks. no clue that you weren't in the same studio. Only found out through bits and pieces of context in the audio. So my question is, what do you use to make the audio so good? It's leaps and bounds better than some podcasts signed to major distributors. I know you use Audacity, but could you take us into more detail with the process? Type of mic? How do you mix the two audio stream together? Thanks. If you get have time to get this email and respond to me, I'd love to hear that. Keep doing you. Tyler, did you ever play Gran Turismo in the early PlayStation days? Much love. Jo- is it John Blaze? It's JXNHN Blaze. It's like the O's missing. Must be John Blaze. John Blazed. Like John Glames. Did you ever John play Glames. Gran Turismo? Uh, I, did not, I didn't play the first one or the second one. I did play a little bit of the third one on PlayStation 2. Um, I didn't have a PlayStation back in the day when PlayStation was big. I only got mine probably a couple of years after the PlayStation 2 came out. Um, so I I didn't play a whole lot of games like that. I'm not really big into racing games. Um, but uh, Gran Turismo is definitely one of the cooler ones. I think one of the coolest things about Gran Turismo, or I think it was Gran Turismo 2, is that um, there was a... Uh, like a boot disc you could get for a Dreamcast that would, you run the boot disc and then you could play Gran Turismo 2 on your Dreamcast with like upgraded graphics and stuff. You you pop in that disc and then you pull it out and you put in the, the PlayStation disc. And I thought that was really cool. They had one of those for like Metal Gear Solid and another game too. But um, yeah. That's, I had that's, no idea that existed. That's really cool. Yeah, it, it's, uh, it's pretty cool. They were going to make, it's called Bleamcast and they were going to make more of them um, like the idea was you would buy the PlayStation game and then you'd buy this sweet Dreamcast um, emulator, basically, that you would run on your Dreamcast. But they got sued a whole bunch. And uh, I think they won those uh, those lawsuits, but they weren't. They, they, by they that won time, at, at what cost? Yeah. yeah, it was at. Yeah, by that time, it was kind of over. And also, like, at what cost? Like, it was still very expensive for them. I think they ended up folding. Um, but uh, yeah, anyway, that's my experience with Gran Turismo is playing it on my Dreamcast a little bit. Fun story. My brother's favorite game on PlayStation was Gran Turismo. So I actually played a lot of it. And I got to nice. say, when you beat a licensing thing, it feels so good. Yeah. When you like get your license, it feels great. I feel pretty good about it. But I love Gran Turismo. My brother played the second one a lot more than the first one. And he actually bought the wheel for it. So we could like wow. pretend like we were driving before we had cars, you know, which is always fun. Mm-hmm. But as far as the audio goes, so yeah, we do record in separate places. Um, we're both recording into our own individual recorders and our mics and everything. Uh, Tyler then sends me his file and I edit it all together and I do some tricks on that. I'll go into more detail in a text response to you, Mr. Blazed. Since I don't know John, I'll just call him Mr. Blazed. You know, that's mm-hmm. pretty good. Sounds like a yeah, uh, villain in a 90s movie. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, um, but yeah, we can go into more detail of it in a text. But yeah, so that's pretty much our process. We both have pretty good audio setups but i don't think i have a i have a h4n recorder and i know tyler's recording straight into audacity but you have some pretty high-tech gear you got a fancy mic i do have a fancy mic so but tyler's i mean tyler's radio he, he, you you have he's a radio experience person you know so that's it's true that's what you're hearing is radio professionalism from tyler and what you're hearing from me is straight up hoping it works <laughs> in editing <laughs> <laughs> But I'll go into more detail. Thank you so much for the email, Mr. Blazed. And uh, do you have anything else, Tyler? I think we're good. I think that's pretty much covers. I think that pretty much covers it. Yeah. I mean, you can find us on our social medias. Oh, yeah. uh, Yeah. I'm at Sneaker Elf, E-L-P-H, on Twitter. And Mike is at Mecoletta, M-E-C-O-L-E-T-T-A. Did you get that right? You crushed it. 
Uh, yes. Everyone Usually Mike the, does the social media part. You, I did it this time. No, I liked it. Usually uh, people try to throw an extra L in my name. They try to give me more letters than I need. But it's only one yeah. L, two T's. It's because the name Colette is way more popular. Yeah. And that has two L's and two T's. So only one L for me. I'm a one L guy. So uh, thank you so much for listening. If you want to help support us, you can tell a friend. Nicholas had a friend tell him about it. And then Nick, mm-hmm. Nick really liked it. Okay. So you could do that. Too. Tell your friends. Maybe they'll like it too. Maybe they'll like it. Uh, you can also rate and review us on uh, Apple Podcasts and tell people if you do listen to the podcast while you do dishes. You know, that would be cool to know. Or if you at least like turn it on for the 10 seconds, you take the plate and you put it in a dishwasher. That counts. Mm-hmm. Still counts. And uh, email us at codexhistorypodcast at gmail.com. And I think that's it. We did it. And we'll go into our next spooky Halloween game next week. This is a surprise. Great. Cool. Well, you want to say bye to everybody? Sure. Goodbye, everybody. <laughs>